when uh, when you heard the words on the intercom system, adrenaline rushed through your body. There were two words that that shot anxiety into my mind, uh, caused my heart to race. Code red. All right, it was the warning call on campus that housed over a hundred troubled children, houses that were spread across the property. Children were separated by age and so the severity of their issues. But if you were working and you heard code red at and then the name of the house, well, then all, all of the available staff from every unit on campus would uh, take off running to the crisis that was at hand. And so it was always like a serious mess when you entered into a unit on code red. It usually wasn't like one kid fighting. It was almost all of them. It usually wasn't one explosive situation, but a whole group of explosive situations. And so we would immediately assess the room and then do our best to put out these emotional fires that were at hand. Sometimes um, it took like a whole campus to settle down one house. Sometimes it took a dozen staff to bring peace to the crisis. But you know, some of those alerts could have been avoided. Not every code read on campus was necessary. Sometimes that, that alert was called because staff didn't do their job like they should. They allowed situations to spiral out of control. They didn't see problems coming. They didn't address what was necessary. They didn't speak any kind of words of encouragement. They didn't seek reconciliation between kids. Some code reds were the result of staff being passive, but certainly not peacemakers. And truth be told, um, it's often our own life that many of us are living in this space in between code reds, meaning we're just waiting for the next drama in our life to pop off and then we'll run to address it. Certainly some of that's unavoidable. Certainly some of that is just the reality of living in a broken and sinful world. But I want to make the case that not everything in our life has to become this crisis of drama and relational suffering. Because if you find yourself this morning constantly living in this state of code red, you might be the main reason for that suffering. You're either creating the drama or you're allowing it to keep happening in your life, but you can't play this victim forever. So this is a message from 1 Samuel 19. It's a message about a moment of incoming crisis. A moment where I'd say it'd be easy to play the victim, a moment where it would be easy to be passive, a moment where it would be easy for these things to just spiral out of control, and yet there's a faithful man and a faithful son and a faithful friend and a man that stands in the gap and a man that becomes a peacemaker. So let's study together. We'll be in 1 Samuel 19. If you have a digital Bible, I'll read out of the ESV. If you have a bulletin, it's all there um, in your bulletin. But before we study, uh, let's pray together. God, we come before you this morning and we state our dependence upon you, knowing that there are many of us. It just feels like our entire life has been a crisis. Or if it, it just feels like we're waiting for one more thing to happen that we have to address. God, for many of us, it, it, it doesn't feel like our life has been marked by any sort of Christ-exalting, calm peace in our life. And yet, as the Word will call us to be, we're called to be peacemakers. God, show us what that really means from your word. God, give us the endurance to bear it all. God, give us the wisdom 
on what this actually means in the thousand variables that we all have to live in. But God, give us grace um, and understanding as we study your word this morning, and we pray these things in your son's name. Amen. There is growing animosity between David and the anointed king and Saul, the present king. David has killed the giant. David has ongoing success against the enemy. David has become covenant friends with Jonathan, Saul's son. David has married the king's daughter. David has become the mortal enemy of Saul. And as verse 28 reminded us from last week, and so Saul was David's enemy continually. And so that is what we walk into today. It's another plot to take David's life. So we'll be in chapter 19. We're just looking at seven verses today. Looking at verse 1, it says this. And Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants that they should kill David. But Jonathan, Saul's son, delighted much in David, and Jonathan told David, Saul, my father seeks to kill you. Therefore, be on your guard in the morning, stay in a secret place, and hide yourself. I'll go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I'll speak to my father about you, and if I learn anything, I'll tell you. And so Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father, and said to him, let not the king sin against his servant David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his deeds have brought good to you. For he took his life in his hand, and he struck down the Philistine, and the Lord worked a great salvation for all Israel. You saw it. You rejoiced. Why then will you sin against the innocent blood by killing David without cause? And so Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan and Saul swore, as the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. And Jonathan called David, and Jonathan reported to him all these things. And Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as before. The question in your notes is, what do peacemakers do? That's an important question. It's an important question because whether we realize it or not, it's an eternal question. So there's this scene in the Gospels where Jesus, he goes up into a mountain with his disciples and they gather around him on the ground and he begins to teach the, these profound and life-changing truths and truths that reveal where real blessings might be found. And so Jesus, he says this to his disciples in Matthew 5, verse 9. He says, blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Peacemakers, meaning those that stand in the gap of conflict, that seek mercy and grace and healing and restoration. Peacemakers, meaning those willing to actually work at making peace with those around them. Jesus is saying those people will be called sons of God. The deduction of reasoning, the children of God are called to be peacemakers. And before I answer what that actually means from our passage today, let me, let me first answer who they are not. And this is not in your notes. Hopefully it's helpful. What are peacemakers not? Well, let me give you point A. Peacemakers are not gaslighters. Meaning they're not people that look at conflict and then distort reality. Gaslighting someone is to take this real conflict in someone's life and then to make them that believe that what they're seeing and feeling, it's not real. It's psychological manipulation. It's a denial of crisis. You can't be a peacemaker by trying to convince someone that everything's fine when it's not. Like even in our narrative today, even as we've already read, Jonathan doesn't hear that his dad is trying to kill David in verse 1 and then runs off to David and says, hey, like dad said this, but he doesn't really mean it. I mean, you just like, don't be scared of Saul. He says crazy stuff all the time. No, peacemakers are not gaslighters. Problems don't go away just because you pretend like they don't exist. 
Secondly, letter B, peacemakers are not people pleasers. Meaning they're not walking around trying to convince everyone and trying to make everyone happy so everyone can be at peace. Sometimes peace is only found when one of the party is never happy with the results. And again, Jonathan, he's not a people pleaser. Even when he's in a position to be one, Jonathan is presented with this problem in verse 1. Should he seek to keep his best friend safe and happy? Or should he seek to keep his own father happy? But he doesn't get to do both, and as the passage shows, he's not even trying to do both. But let me boldly say this as someone that struggles with this. People pleasers don't really care that much about situational peace. People pleasers just want everyone to like them so they can quiet the anxiety that they have in their own mind. And I promise that's a rat race that, that's not going to end. You can't be a peacemaker and a people pleaser. So that's who they are not. Okay, but what do they do? Let me show you the rest from the word. What do peacemakers do? Here's point one if you're a note taker. Peacemakers anticipate problems before they become a reality. We have this moment of potential crisis in verse 1. Saul spoke to Jonathan and to all his servants that they should kill David, which seems like a completely oblivious statement to make by Saul. We know from verse 1 and the past few chapters that Jonathan loves David as his own soul. We also know from 1 Samuel 18, 16, that all of Israel and Judah love David. So this isn't a king's request to murder the guy that no one likes. Saul, in his blind rage and sin and in jealousy, he requests the murder of the guy everyone loves. What does Jonathan do? Well, very beginning of verse 2, Jonathan goes to tell David. The very first step of being a peacemaker is this wisdom to see the path that you're currently walking on. There's this wisdom that a father gives to a son in Proverbs 4. It says this in verse 23, Keep your heart with all vigilance, for from it it flows the springs of life. Put away from you crooked speech, and put devious talk far from you. Let your eyes look directly forward. Your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet. Then in all of your ways will be sure. Do not swerve to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. Peacemakers first make sure to ponder the path under their own feet, that we keep our eyes forward, that we walk carefully, that we don't swerve into the oncoming traffic of evil. And Jonathan, like so far, has proven that true. He's been faithful to the Lord. He's been faithful to God's people. He's been on the right path. And in so doing, now he has the wisdom to see the path that other people are on. Jonathan he anticipates this very serious problem brewing among God's people, even his own family. Like he's not waiting around to see if it comes true. He's not waiting around to see how this plays out. He anticipates it early before it becomes the reality of David in the grave. Hello? Hello? Part of being a biblical peacemaker, oh wait, it's fine. I, I feel like if anyone's phone rings in church, they're like, oh, I hate cell phones, I hate church, um, but it's okay, it happens, I promise. I've been in student ministry for far too long. Um, Y'all are fine. Part of being a biblical peacemaker is the wisdom 
to anticipate problems before they become a full-blown reality. In fact, the elders, um, the elders of this church at monthly elder meetings talk about this. A lot of people wonder, like, what do the elders talk about every month? Well, we have a whole bunch of things we have to talk about, but this is part of it. We call it, as others have, anticipatory leadership, meaning part of shepherding the church is not just waiting around for a fire to start so we can put it out. It's shepherding potential fires in the church. It's shepherding the smoke before the flame. That is what anticipatory leaders and peacemakers do. They have the wisdom to see potential problems before things are out of hand. That's the very first thing that a peacemaker does. We anticipate problems with our own children before they're out of control. We anticipate relationship conflicts with a brother or sister in Christ and then seek to reconcile like before bitterness and awkwardness set in. We anticipate issues in our marriage and we seek to address them before it turns into this explosive fight. The best peacemakers are those that sense unrest before the unrest sets in. Jonathan's there. Dad has said and done crazy things before. This time he realizes he means it. Jonathan's wise enough to do something about it, which leads to the second point. What do peacemakers do? Point two, peacemakers confront the issue with urgency. Immediately we see in the text that Jonathan, he goes straight to David. My father seeks to kill you. Be on your guard this morning. Stay in a secret place. Hide yourself, and I'll go talk to my dad about you. If I learn anything new, I'll come find you and tell you. There is urgency in the confrontation. Jonathan is not waiting. Jonathan is not hoping things get better. Jonathan is not wishing that dad changes his mind. He confronts the issue head on before there is blood to be spilled. And you might be thinking, well, how urgent should we be as peacemakers? Like how quickly should we address an issue that we see going on in our lives? Well, that depends entirely on how serious the potential problem is. For David, this is life or death. So yeah, Jonathan is quite urgent. And sometimes the potential conflict is not between two other parties, but you and someone else. In that sense, this is what Jesus says again in Matthew 5, verse 23. So if you're offering your gift at the altar, and when you're there, you remember your brother, your brother has something against you, then leave your, alt- leave your gift at the altar and go. First be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. It's not saying, man, just keep serving the church, hope things get better. It's leave your gift on the altar, and do what you can to be at peace with a brother or sister in Christ that has something against you. Sometimes confronting with urgency is immediate, as we see in the passage. Or in other cases, it's days, weeks, or even months, but the calling is never. Never just pretend like everything's fine. Let's be honest uh, with each other this morning as we open the word. We're not great at being peacemakers because we aren't great at confronting others. If you love confronting others, like that's your little thing, you're probably not known for being a peaceable person. In fact, if you find yourself, you're like, I feel like I'm always confronting others, you're not God's gift to peacemaking. You're just a man or woman that can't see the log in your own eye. Most of us hate confrontation, um, and then we just don't do it. I'd say the church is the biggest offender, because here's where I would say most of our church experiences have been over the years. We've either seen churches ignore problems in hopes that things just magically get better, 
or we've seen churches address problems in the most loud and mean and hateful of ways. Simply, most of us have not seen a lot of healthy conflict in a church. But as I've told church staff here and many others, East River Park is and will continue to be different. We're going to have the wisdom to see problems coming our way. We're going to have the boldness and the courage to confront those problems with urgency. There will be no peace in the royal family if Jonathan just lets things slide. There will be no peace in your family if you just continue to ignore glaring, sinful, and damaging issues. There will be no peace peace in the church family if we just ignore sin and the dysfunction in our own congregation. And yet, what does peacemaking confrontation look like? Well, Jonathan at least gives us a glimpse of some of it in verses 4 through 5. What do peacemakers do? Here's point three. Peacemakers highlight all the good things of the situation. If I could go back and add more to point three, I would say peacemakers highlight all the good things of the situation in truth. Look what Jonathan does in verse four. The very first thing we see, Jonathan spoke well of David to Saul, his father. Let let not the king sin against his servant David. Like David, David's never sinned against you. David's deeds, they've only brought good things to you. David, he, he literally took his life in his own hands and struck down the Goliath from Gath. The Lord worked a great salvation through David. You saw it, Dad. Like, don't, don't you remember? You watched all of this happen and you rejoiced. Why will you now sin against David by killing innocent blood without cause? That is what a Galatians 6.1 confrontation looks like. Galatians 6.1, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgression, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch yourself, lest you too be tempted. Jonathan, whose heart is right, seeks to restore his dad in this spirit, spirit of gentleness. Jonathan doesn't ignore the sin. He actually calls out the sin twice in just three verses. He is, he's not being judgmental or mean. He's calmly and gently telling Saul the truth. And Jonathan, he doesn't highlight all of the negative things in Saul's life. I mean, even when he had a lot of ammo to do it. Jonathan could have lit up his dad with negativity. But he calmly reminds his dad of all the good things. These are all the good things that the Lord has done. All of the good things that the Lord has done through his servant David. It's this confrontation rooted in a positive reality. It's a confrontation pleading for all these good things that have happened in the past to just continue to happen. What a great and healthy example for us in a peacemaker's confrontation. Because I have confronted people with truth, and then my heart wasn't right. I was wrong. I've had, to apologize. I've had to apologize to people in this church. You can say all of the right things in the wrong way. I have also confronted people with, with negativity. I didn't paint for, paint for them a picture of hope. I didn't remind them of all the good things the Lord has done in their life. I painted a picture of anger and condemnation. Like, what kind of Christian friend or parent or grandparent do you want to be? What kind of church do we want to be? My prayer is that our lives are filled with godly peacemakers, those that see these problems before they implode, those that confront issues with urgency, those that highlight good and hopeful and beautiful things while never ignoring the hard truth of sin and its deadly effects. 
meaning the peacemakers are active, a ton of work to have peace in the relationships in your life. It takes a lot of humbleness. It takes a lot of forgiveness. It takes a lot of mercy. It takes a lot of listening. And by God's good grace, sometimes people do listen, and then relationships are restored. What do peacemakers do? For, well, peacemakers restore relationships that were broken. They do. That's where we land in verse 6. Saul finally listens to someone. You listen to the voice of Jonathan, his own son. In fact, Saul, even, he makes this oath. As the Lord lives, he shall not be put to death. So Jonathan, he follows through on his words to a friend. He calls to David. He told him everything that his dad has said. And as the end of verse 7 shows us, Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as before. There's restoration. There's reconciliation. When we humbly walk through points 1 through 3, we will sometimes see renewed and restored relationships in this life. I've seen it in my own family. I've seen it in our own friend group. I've seen it in this church. Broken and fractured relationships healed by the grace of God. And I have prayed often, and I would counsel you to pray as well. God, would you please restore what feels like it can't be restored? And I've prayed that honest prayer for myself a thousand times. Sometimes, in God's sovereign mercy, he answers that prayer with restoration. So yeah, we should not lose hope as peacemakers. If Christ Jesus, who did, walked out of the tomb, I'm confident that he can restore any relational drama that you have going on in your life. He can. He can. He's able. He's willing. Let us be peacemakers in a world, or even churches, that just want to fight all the time. Let us work to create peace in our life. No one had, had heard from him in years. The memories of him, I, I'd say, are slim and fading. I remember standing on the beach in Clearwater, Florida, uh, as a small child, I could see the rain quickly heading our way, and uh, my, my uncle looked down at me, and he told me that we should start running. And he looked just like my dad. He was always uh, fun and kind and gentle to me, and we ran back to the hotel out of the rain, and that's the last memory that I think I have of him. I don't know what happened. I don't. To be honest, none of it's really my business anyway, but there were problems in the family, um, problems that were spoken and probably unspoken. Eventually, it became this full-blown reality, and then he left. The un my uncle, he left our family. He moved away. Uh, to my knowledge, he doesn't talk to any of us anymore. And I watched the way that it impacted my dad. I watched the way it hurt others. And I'm confident there were, there were many, and I'd probably s still many, prayers. Prayers for restoration. Prayers for peace. Um, a few years ago, my, my dad, he, he finally found his brother's address in the suburbs of Chicago. And he drove up to see him, and he knocked on, on the door, and my uncle answered, and his first and only words to my dad were, please don't ever contact me again. And then he shut the door. And that was it. To my knowledge, that's where things have landed. Because the brutal and painful reality is that you and I can fulfill the role of peacemakers as much as we want. And sometimes it doesn't work out. It doesn't. Sometimes there's no peace. And there may never be peace in that situation, even in your best efforts. 
Even in your most humble pleas, even in your most painful prayers, it just never arrives. How true it was for David and Saul. Verse 7, things go back to the way they, they were before. Things were once again calm in the royal family, but verse 8, well, verse 8 was coming. And as you, if you have a physical Bible or a digital Bible, you can see it. And there was war again. See, even in Jonathan's best efforts, um, it's just temporary. It wouldn't last. Saul would want David dead again. Blessed are the peacemakers. Let this church be full of them. Let your own family be full of them. But life, is, it's just not as clean and as simple and as pretty as we would want it to be. Sometimes things just feel like they'll stay broken forever. And yet, there is someone greater that we just have to mention. There's a greater peacemaker than Jonathan. There's a great, greater peacemaker than, than you and I. Ephesians 2, verse 13, But now in Christ Jesus, you who once were far off have been, have been brought near by the blood of Christ, for he himself is our peace, who has made us both one and has broken down in his flesh the dividing wall of hostility by abolishing the law of commandments expressed in ordinances that he might create in himself one new man in place of the two, so making peace. He might reconcile us both to God in one body through the cross, thereby killing the hostility. And he came and preached peace to you who are far off and peace to those who are near. Simply, your summary point is Christ becomes our ultimate peacemaker. That Christ becomes our greatest and our ultimate peacemaker. That through his death and his resurrection, we are now offered peace with the holy God, that Christ Jesus, he's the one that stands in the gap. That things won't stay broken forever. That you and I are offered eternal peace through Christ, an eternal peace with God, an eternal peace that will one day eradicate every painful and broken relationship in your life. Blessed are the peacemakers. Blessed are those in Christ who have peace with God. And one day, the ultimate peacemaker will quiet every drama that you have going on. So yeah, blessed are the peacemakers, for they are the sons and daughters of God. Let's pray together. God, we confess how difficult this all is. Knowing that there are a thousand variables, hundreds of what-ifs, in our situations and drama and crisis in our life, God, and we pray and we want peace. And many of us have been faithful to pursue it and just can't find it. God, we're thankful for the truth of your word. We're thankful for the faithfulness of Jonathan that stood in the gap, but God, that it might point us to the ultimate peacemaker in Christ Jesus who stood between us and you and took your wrath that was directed our way, where we were once hostile between us and you, God, and Christ Jesus became the greatest and ultimate peacemaker. And, and I'm thankful for the truth and the promises of your word that one day there will be lasting peace. And, and one day, every frustrating and tearful prayer will be answered. And so I'm thankful for the truth of your word that might point us to Christ Jesus in 1 Samuel 19. Uh, God, we trust you with uh, whatever you would like to do 
with this message, and we pray these things in your son's name.